Today is a special Sunday for us. We're graduating our seniors, and our seniors are growing up. They're young adults now. They're moving out of the basement, and they're headed off into the real world, maybe college, maybe career, maybe the military. But I know for them, I know they're really excited, right? And for you parents, you're pretty excited, and then you're kind of sad too, right? Because they're, they're your babies, and they're, they're moving on to the next chapter of life. And so with the next chapter of life, hey, we, we remember this is a great time. Um, these few years are just incredible, a, a time of growth. But to be honest, it's a time of challenge too, right? They'll be challenged in a lot of ways. I mean, they're, they're moving from home into the safety of home and, and the foundations of Christianity to a place that may not believe what we believe, right? I mean, they may go and they may find something different or hear something different better from friends or, or college roommates, bosses or professors or work associates or maybe, maybe, like I said, roommates too. And so if I think back in 1998 when I first started college, my very first class, my very first professor and the very first thing to come out of his mouth all right, was this. And I dressed up as a tie to look like a professor today. And I don't wear glasses, but I'm going to wear them right now because I want to look more studious. Am I good? Because I can't see any of you guys right now. <laughs> okay. My name is Dr. Horner. This is zoology class, not zoology. All human beings are animals. I don't care what you think, feel, or believe. We're all animals. It's the first thing I ever heard in college. First thing someone said to me from my first professor was a challenge of faith, right? And I knew because God's grace that I knew him, I put my pen down and didn't take that note. And I think this ties in pretty well with where our students are going in this day and age and the challenges that they'll face in, in a great part and great season of their life. So we'll also look at Elijah this morning. All right. If you'll turn to your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 16 to start off. Now, Elijah is this desert dwelling prophet during a time of no rain. And at this time, Israel is split between Israel and Judah. And there is the absolute worst king to ever reign over Israel. And his name is King Ahab. And King Ahab's dad was King Omri. And King Omri was really, really bad. But the Bible tells us in 1 Kings 16.30 that Ahab, son of Omri did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any other king before him. So how would you like to be King Ahab? And you're, you're doing your thing, and you're meeting other people, and going to other tribes and, and places, and you, you put your hand out and you say, my name is King Ahab. You've probably heard of me before. My dad was the worst, but I beat him. I'm even worse, right? Well, equally as wicked, King Ahab had a wife. And her name is Jezebel. Her name was Jezebel. And one of the things that Ahab and Jezebel did was to help promote the false worship of this Baal character. You've heard of Baal before. Not only did they help bring in and help promote the worship of King Baal, they actually built a place of worship in Israel for Baal. They made him their king. Now you may think, how in the world is Israel in this place? Because it's not just Baal, but there's other gods too. So if you, if you remember looking out at night and seeing the stars, it'd be like this. There's Yahweh up there, the correct worship, and all sorts of other trash. But it's not true. It's idolatry. It's pagan. It's false. How did Israel get over here? How did they get to this point? Well, let's rewind a little bit. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. 
Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel. This is the Lord speaking. This is his warning. You shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their own gods. Solomon held fast to these in love, though. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after their own gods. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. There's two things that catch my eye in those verses. Number one, there's a warning from God. Don't do it. If you associate with them, guess what? They're going to turn your heart, your heart, towards their gods. And did it anyways. And the other thing that speaks to me or speaks out to me is a number 700. 700 wives. 699 more than I have. (laughs) Okay. Well, Elijah and God both, they desperately want the people to turn their hearts back to God. So there's a challenge. I think everybody likes a good challenge, but this is, this is a great challenge. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through 24. King Ahab puts a little get-together. Sends word throughout all of Israel and assembles the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people, and he says to them, How long will you waver between two opinions? Listen, if the Lord is God, worship the Lord. If Baal is God, worship him. But let's do this. Let's have a challenge. You get a bull, I get a bull. You cut it up. I cut it up for a sacrifice. You put it on an altar. We'll call out the one that answers by fire is God. So Elijah instructs the prophets of Baal, prepare an ox over an altar and call on your God. In 1 Kings 18, 26, so they took the bull that was given to them and they prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. Now, I've got to call a timeout right quick, okay? Because the next few verses get real junior high. And I like it a lot. Verse 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until the blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response No one answered, and no one paid attention. Of course, just like the song we sang, you have no rival. You have no equal. You are God. There's no one like you. There's nothing like you. So Elijah plays quarterback, and he looks at everybody and brings them all in, all these people, and he gets ready to set something up. He fixes the altar that had been knocked down, takes 12 stones, each one representing a tribe of the sons of Jacob. And at the time of the sacrifice, he prays. And I, I just imagine it being very quiet and very still as all these people are waiting to see what happens. And he calls out to God, God, turn the hearts of your people. Answer me so that they can see that you again our God. And all of a sudden, God consumes 
the offering on the altar. And I look at that picture and I think, that's pretty glorious. That's pretty amazing. And I like that. And, and that really kind of helps me understand the whole story visually. But i got to admit to you, as I studied this, several times into it, something hit me. You see, if that's the image that we have in the story, I think that's a good image, but we're missing something if that's all we have. And that is, this is also a story of grace, right? Look at verse 39. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. You see, God kept the fire on the offering and consumed nothing else. The water, the dirt, yes, and the offering. But those that didn't know Him, those that had turned their hearts away from Him, and those that worshipped other things in God's face, he didn't consume those things. Our God is slow to anger and wrath. Yeah? Grace. This is a great story about grace. Now, Elijah handles the prophets of Baal a little bit differently in verse 40. But I've got to also take a look at this story and think, this, this has a lot to do with idolatry and false worship. And I know this is very black and white, this story. You've got this, this worship of Baal and other gods, and you've got our God. And I, I see the idolatry in this, but I also think this is a great story of grace, but also humanity too, right? Because I think as people, as humans, I think we struggle with idolatry as well, right? The definition being anything you love more than God, simple, it becomes idolatry. Now I've got some images up here. You know, these things in and of themselves are not, are not bad things, except the center one, of course. But uh, the car and, 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 the, and the worship and, and everything and the cards, I mean, when we love these things more than God, then they become acts of idolatry. And for our students, when they go into the next chapter of life, this being a big challenge, they're going to have their own challenges too. You guys remember, you know, that first semester, it can be a little bit tough trying to figure out who you are, right? And then any other challenge that they may face as well. It's a great, great time of life, but it's also a great time of challenge as well as learning who you are and who you belong to too as well. And so the Bible is very clear, though, that in these challenges... In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, that we consider this all pure joy, every challenge. Brothers and sisters, when you face trials of any kind, because you know that the testing of your faith will produce perseverance and endurance. And let perseverance and endurance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And so... Last hour, I encouraged our students this. Just really three things that I wanted them to take from this lesson. And number one, in your next chapter of life, walk with God. Because what I had to understand and realize is I would put God over here, maybe in the mornings, and pray and focus. Then I would do my other things, right? Maybe, maybe class, and then maybe work, and then studying in the evening, and then hanging out or whatever. And then what I realized was that I would do these things and push God further back. Instead, if we looked at God and, and kind of dealt with him and, and worshipped him and walked with him, kind of like a wagon wheel right here where Jesus is the center, that hub right there, then every spoke represents something going on in our life. So maybe one spoke represents our friendships. What if we put God in the center of our friendships? Maybe another spoke represents work. What if we talked to God and walked with God, represented God as we worked? Would that change other people? Or what if another one is volunteering or studying? God, help me find you in this stuff that I'm studying. Where are you in this? Show me. Help me walk with you as I study through this. And so if we can understand that we walk with God and put him in the center of all the things that we're doing, it changes the way 
that we walk with him in our relationship with him. Constantly walking with God. Number two, love others. If I can encourage students, another thing, love others. I think in our culture and in our world, there was a time where our voices and what we said carried more weight. I think our lost world is looking for hope. And I think they want to see it because they're probably tired of just hearing it. And so the way that we act, the way that we represent Christ, but I think almost more importantly, the way that we react can change and carry a lot of weight, can change the way people view God. You have something. You claim Christ. I'm going to watch you. You don't know that I'm watching you, but I want to see how you act and how you react because I'm desperate for hope. Walk with God and love others. And the last one, serve. You know, Jesus served and showed us how to serve. And we started a program a few years ago, a few years ago called Do Loss. The purpose of Do Loss was to help students do what Jesus did by serving and then learn to serve so that when they go off to the next place in life, they're, they're used to serving and helping. And so my encouragement to those students was to get plugged in. As soon as you leave home, and if you go to another place, another town, find a church and continue to serve. All right. Now, I've asked a friend, a graduate, Jacob Huffman, come on up here, buddy. Jacob just graduated from Weatherford College, and Jacob has been part of our Do Loss program for a couple of years now. And so, Jacob... First of all, tell us a little bit about what you do in Dulos. Okay. Um, first off, uh, I graduated from Weatherford High School. Uh, High school. I just want to point that out. Well, well he's like, he so looks like a college student, right? Um, but I've been fortunate, fortunate enough for the past couple of years to uh, serve fifth and sixth grade students in Dulos ministry. I've been a small group leader. Uh, I've stuck with the same kids for the past couple years, getting to watch them go from fifth graders in small groups and talk about uh, their love for God and uh, what, they, what he means to the, them and what uh, he does for them and see their conversation develop the past couple years into sixth graders and just gotten to watch them grow. So that's what I do. Okay, very good. So as a high school servant, have you grown spiritually? And if you have, would you elaborate a little bit on that? Absolutely. Growth has been a huge part of my time in Dulos, and a lot of it has been uh, in patience. Uh, getting, to do, uh, getting to work with fifth and sixth graders, uh, it takes a lot of that, a lot of patience, a lot of love and understanding. And with that, God has been great through Dulos, uh, growing me and them at the same time. Okay. And then for those students or parents they don't know, uh, if they want to get their kid involved in serving, those students that are afraid to serve, maybe a little bit, they're on the fence, would you encourage them? Would you recommend serving in Dulos? I would absolutely recommend serving in Dulos. Um, the great thing about it is that it's student service. It's not, uh, it's mostly not mingled. It's just student serving. So you get the opportunity to serve with your peers, people the same age as you. Uh, you get to serve God the way that you were talking about. He showed us to serve, and he showed us how to serve. So you get the opportunity to do that and glorify God. But at the same time, you can build relationships with other people and with other students. And you don't need to lead small groups maybe like I do. Maybe you could work with much younger babies, or you could do stuff with the band. Do loss is so much more than just working with uh, kids. And there's something for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. You guys get it for Jacob Huffman. Jacob is also going to serve with us this summer as a, an intern, so we're excited about that. All right, parents, and I've encouraged in, in our students with three different things. I want to encourage parents with one thing. If there's nothing you've heard this morning, please hear this, and I'm talking to myself as well because I'm a parent. As the primary disciple makers of our own kids... If we don't disciple our kids, the world will disciple our kids for us. And I don't know if you've watched the media a lot lately, but this world is pretty crazy right now. And I don't want the world and, and everything going on to disciple 
my two kids, Grady and Sawyer. All right? I want to teach them the foundations at home. I want them to see how I act and react, how we love God and teach them the Bible. So that when they're ready for the next chapter of life, by God's grace, they know God, they walk with him, they know the foundations so they can reflect him.